Jeff. Jeff Scholes. I said that right, didn't I? Yeah. Dude, we're doing this. Thank you so much for sitting down with me, my man. Yeah. How's it Thanks going? Thanks for coming over. Yeah, it's good. Everything's going good. Yeah, man. Dude, your uh, your cats are so well behaved. <laughs> They're not like in the mix. So we have a little dog, and um, I've I've done some podcasts, and like she'll be right up under everybody, dude, just in the mix. I'm just like, golly, just I just mm-hmm. need a second. Bruno would be doing that right now if he was around. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe dogs are just more like they just need more attention. Dude, cats are killers. They don't really care about you. <laughs> <laughs> really don't. These guys just feed them. Dude, I saw something. It said, um, "It said uh, you like you don't lose cats because like, dude, cats they they're smart. Like they can go and like wander the neighborhood mm-hmm. for or probably like a mile away and make their way back. So it's like if your cat doesn't come back, they just don't like you." <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I keep my cats indoor because um, kind of geeky, con- conservation-wise, cats kill many, many native birds. Oh, yeah. And they're like natural predators. Oh, yeah. So I just keep my cats indoors because it just decimates bird populations. Yeah. So And you have all kinds of different pathogens diseases and diseases. Diseases and different things. Like yeah. That. That, that was a good joke. I, 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 I know where you're coming from. I saw that. I was like, oh, that's that's kind of funny. <laughs> that's kind of funny, dude. Um, but let's let's start with, because uh, I want to talk, we're going to get kind of geeky here for, for the listeners. Like we're going to dive into some stuff. I'm involved. It's always geeky. <laughs> that's totally cool, dude. Um, so you are a sports psychologist, right? Or, uh, so just uh, lay it out, put it out there in the first part, put it Uh, out there. I'm still working on my PhD. Okay. I'm not a licensed professional yet. Okay. And this is a big problem within sports psychology right right now. Anyone can call themselves a sports psychologist. Yeah. There is, it's not a protected term. So where like being a clinical psychologist, you have to be licensed in order to have that title. Okay. A life coach. And there's people out there within the ethos that work with professional MMA athletes. I'm not going to say names that claim to be sports psychologists. All right. Yeah. Um, It's not a protected term, but there are certain things you can look at if you're an informed um, consumer. There's like certificates through the Association of Applied Sports Psychologists. Um, There's a certificate called the Certified Mental Performance Coach Certificate. That is the best indicator that someone has been educated and passed a test to be there, or if they're a licensed psychologist. I am a consultant. Uh, I do sports psychology consulting through a Division I school at St. Louis University. I'm under the supervision of Dr. Michael Ross, Um, and I do a lot of sports psychology. I'm not a certified professional yet. Yet. So I'm just speaking about this for educational purposes. Right. Um, But I do do a lot of work right now with Division I athletes yeah um as part of my work with st louis university right well it's good to like have that understanding that hey man there are some people out there that are going to use this title and they're not really like they didn't go through the same like education like whether whether it's jujitsu or anything like not everything's created equal right like yeah I mean, dude, if so, you're, so basically if somebody's like, all right, man, well, I played sports and I studied psychology and I have an understanding of the mind, I'm just going to just call myself a sports psychologist and just, unfortunately, just open up that. a shop. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. And I, I think in sports psych, you can find people that have different degrees like kinesiology. Yeah. Um, they understand how the body moves. Um, and there's people that have an education in, let's say, um, education. So they can get um, a certificate in sports psych as well, but they're going to be what's called an educational sports psychologist where they do more like, um, let's say, all the things around sport. They educate people as far as how to do the basic mental skills, which maybe we'll talk about today. Um, But I'm in that brand that's called the clinical sports psychologist where they actually work with athletes to improve performance, but also athletes are humans too, and they deal with mental illness like anybody else. Yeah. And, you know, imagine coming back from an incredible injury. There's some mental barriers that occur. It's a big mental barrier. Yeah. 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 Have you gone through any injuries that you had yeah, to? Yeah. Uh, so um, long story, uh, I I trained all year with this guy named Brian Marisi. He was my teammate back in the day when I was purple belt. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he's competing as much anymore, but he was a killer back in the day. Yeah. Trained all year with him. We were both purple belts. Went to the world championship. Like the year before that, I had medaled, got third place at blue belt. And then came back. I was really hoping to get something at the World Championships, IBJJF. Yeah. And then my first fight was with my training partner. Oh, that's a bummer, dude. It broke my heart. Dude, so I, I would go out on my motorcycle and cruise around. I'll make this quick. And I just I lost it, oh, shattered shit. my foot. 
I had to go through multiple surgeries. I wasn't, I was off the mats for like a year collectively. Oh, wow. So it's finally gotten to the point where my foot doesn't bother me anymore, but I've had multiple incredible injuries that it was tough working through those, you know, getting back into the competitive environment. What year was that? 2012, I want to say. 2012. Dang. So how long do you feel like it took you like mentally to kind of get to a place where you're like, man, I I trust, you know, this limb, my, Mm -hmm. my foot, like, cause I've, I've, uh, I've torn my rotator cuff and, and had like a slap tear yeah. and, uh, or my labrum rather and had like a slap tear in my rotator cuff. And like that recovery, like I can just remember after surgery where like you can't use your arm, you know where you were. And then, I mean, that's hell in itself because you're constantly like thinking about like getting back to this place, yeah. but you're so far behind like physically. So like mm-hmm. it does wreak havoc on your mind. But then once you even get back to training, there's still this whole other barrier of even like trusting whatever was fixed, whether right. that's your shoulder or your knee or right. your foot or your ankle. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me, it took me years because I had to get some plates taken out i had internal fixation so i had like two plates and 13 screws and until i could pull that out and they had to put bone chips in long process because you're always walking on your feet right yeah i I came back too soon and i cracked the plates because i was trying to play uh you know train jiu-jitsu again yeah it took me years before i was able to have people put me in a foot lock and not panic yeah you know now it's my stronger foot you know Mm -hmm. um i'm not going to tell which uh which foot it is for competitors out there that (laughs) might be hunting for it it's a Uh, secret uh, you can see, you, you know which one it is. Um, so with me, it took me years, but there's that component of just being in that environment and, and being exposed to that situation where like, let's say somebody's sprawling on your shoulder, yeah, you're going to be like very hesitant. And the more you get put in that situation and you don't have a negative outcome, the more you're going to habituate or get used to it. You build a tolerance to that. Yeah. And it, you know, there's ways that we can do that in working with athletes. We can set up situations work on whatever mental barriers, maybe something they're saying to themselves is getting in the way. Yeah. Working through emotions that might become that come as part of that. Um, so usually it's a protocol between four to six weeks that we work athletes to work through an injury. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different, in, like you could use some kind of imagery technique. Sometimes that helps. You can also put them in environments where they just learn how to contend with whatever stress is there for them. Also managing their stress, which is usually related to, yeah. um, their injury and then also getting them to have some social support from their team because oftentimes when we get injured we're not hanging out with our buddies anymore so secluded yeah yeah and you get isolated and that makes you feel worse and that actually prolongs your injury yeah so we get them to seek social support and do all these things for me it took me years to recover yeah man it can and it's funny because like whatever you fix is usually coming back just way, way stronger. You know what I mean? Like my, my other, like the shoulder I got surgery on is better than the other one. I feel like, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? But it just, it does, it takes time to like get to that place to where you really trust it. Um, I found that going, it, you mentioned like the, the social isolation part, like, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're not going to the gym or whatever the case may be, I found just going to technique and just like sitting there on the side was a big help. Yeah. Yeah, just, I would do that with my crutches all the time. Yeah, dude, just just to like just take it in. Like, what's going on there? If you're just like watching and you're not participating, like, what's happening there? How can you get better doing that? I think um, <clears throat> you can keep keep some mental sharpness, even though you're not able to do techniques. Um, and that's what I've been doing a lot during this pandemic is just visualizing and and watching actual fights. You can mentally rehearse without, let's say. Um, having your body physically. So you're not going to have the conditioning component, but you'll have the decision-making capabilities. Yeah. And there's like a lot of things that go into any kind of technique, right? There's a timing, there's a, an awareness, there's um, being aware of your own, um, let's say balance in doing the technique. Right. Yeah. And, and I think going out there and watching being part of that environment keeps you motivated, keeps you focused where a lot of times if we get injured and we start playing video games, you know, that, that time, that habit that you would normally have where you go to the gym every Tuesday, Thursday, or whenever it might be. Right. Now that's, I'm going to go play Warzone instead. Right. You know, yeah. then you just get out of that environment and it's hard to pick it up again. Right. You know, we're just going to the school and watching technique and being around you get that social piece, but you're also getting that habitual piece that your body just knows that, Okay. Every Tuesday, Thursday at this time I go to the gym. Yeah. Which is an important part of motivation as habit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like the, the body and the mind is so interesting that it's always looking for, um, 
like routine or something to make sense of, right? So we have a lot of little triggers. And then if you don't, like environmental triggers, you know what I mean? Like um, when I was listening to your podcast, you're talking about uh, the podcast you did with Josh McKinney. For all, yeah. you, all you folks listening, the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu podcast with Josh McKinney. Um, but you're talking about how like you like to study – like in the room that you're going to take the test in because mm -hmm. like environment will have these like these triggers for your mind, right? Mm -hmm. That's context, uh, context uh, related uh, memory. So like there's cues in the environment, uh, context dependent. There we go. So uh, there's cues in the environment that will um, cue your memory. And that, uh, that's a lot of times how our memory works is it, it's cued. Uh, that's how we recall things is by having a cue. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's as simple as like mnemonic devices that we have, you know, like um, never eat soggy waffles to remember north, south, east, west. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's a mnemonic. It helps us remember those things. Yep. Um, studying cues in the environment allow you to, to bring up whatever knowledge that you need. And, and by training or visualizing yourself in that environment, even yeah. you can place down cues for yourself to be able to perform and remember techniques. And, you know, it's just funny how the brain works. So why don't you hack and use the things to your benefit? So like state dependent also. So if you're always training after you drink a cup of coffee, you should be drinking a cup of coffee before you go to compete. Yeah. You know, everything should be the same. And that's why pre-performance routines are really, really important for athletes because yeah. you're getting that same state every single time. It's just as simple as doing the same kind of warm up, making sure you eat the same kind of food. Yeah. You know, there's a story and I can't confirm it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to espouse it right now, but like Michael Phelps would eat the same thing, have the same routine, wake up, and swim the same amount of laps right. every day, and then he'd do the same thing before you compete. So he already knew what to expect. Right, right. How much, um, how much studying have you done of like flow state? Quite a bit. Yeah. So have you read, have you read like flow by like chicks at me high? Uh, cover to cover, probably not. But I've I've gone through it several times. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, there's several books. I mean, like whether it's that one or like Stealing Fire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what was the other one? By the same guys. Ah, uh, fuck. It was Stealing Fire. There's another one before that. Was there like a Superman one? Yeah, The Rise of Superman, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of that's talking about flow state and, um, you know, a, a lot of getting to that place of flow state are your routines, yeah. right? Like your rituals. Like what are you doing to get yourself into that state? Yeah. I, I think that's a really important part. There's nine theoretical dimensions of flow that are important. And oh, I, really? I nine. knew this was going to come up, and I was like, I, I'm going to have to remember these right now. Oh, man. Um, but there's, like, things as simple as, like, having a specific goal, having a balance between challenge and skill, um, being focused on the task at hand. Right. And, you know, we've done um, flow analyses of teams before, done team assessments, and then you make specific recommendations for particular athletes based on their flow profile. That's something that sports psychologists can do. What is uh, a flow profile? So you have like a, a questionnaire okay. that you give to people and then they have basically given this to thousands of people and you can say based on their profile, how do they compare high or low on certain dimensions of flow? Okay. Um, like there's this one called like um, autotelic experience, which is how much they enjoy the activity. Okay. Some people just naturally enjoy the activity more than others. Some people, um, when they're in that flow state, things slow down for them. Yeah. But that's really rare. Okay? Is it? Yeah, that's a really rare component of flow. Now, uh, when you say slow down, sorry to pause. Is, yeah, it, no is it like time slows down or that the, like whatever is physically happening slows down? And I take that a lot to like fighting because that's just so much of my competition base. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, Whenever I would get into flow state, I always thought I was an adrenaline junkie, but mm -hmm. I, I realized I was a flow junkie. Like, mm -hmm. there's nothing like being in flow, bro. Oh, yeah. Oh, my it's God. Nice. It feels so But, like, everything just clicked, and, you know, time didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And, like, you just, everything was sharper. You could just see things come. So it's like everything does kind of, you're just so tuned in mm -hmm. to where, like, this conceptual thing of time is, I mean, it's, 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 like, I feel like a lot of things, um, it's just like situation relevant, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. an hour can last forever if you're at the job, or it can last like two seconds if you're having a good time, right? Yeah. So it's like, so it's both, right? It's just like how you perceive it, and then also like the physical things that are happening might slow down. I mean, to like stay away from two theoretical, like, discussions of time you know we have a very western view of time being linear right but it's not necessarily like that in other cultures yeah um but like the perception of time slows down 
Yeah. So like you know, in Max Payne, that movie that happened with Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. Play, did you uh, just play that game? I, I didn't. I played the game. But he could yeah. like see things slow down. Super that, slow. That perception of time seems to slow down because people are able to process things so efficiently with their brain. Okay. They're able to make critical decisions and see things as if they're happening slower. Oh. And that's just a um, part of the fight or flight response that you're able to. As soon as you get that adrenaline jump, dump, your things go into overdrive. Yeah. So that's just one component of flow. And, and, and just to, to finish off the point here. Yeah, please do. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Uh, so like if, let's say the athlete is hitting all the other domains of flow, but they're not getting into flow every single time. So we say, all right, well, why don't you, and we find this one component of flow is low for them compared to other people. We'd make a specific recommendation saying, all right, well, why don't you just try to have fun? All right, go out there. Don't worry about competing. Don't worry about scoring. Just go out there, try to have fun, have a good time. And I think that recommendation would help out with that one domain of flow, increase that one domain of flow, and then increase their overall ability to get into the flow state because it's a flow state, right? It comes and goes right. throughout the training session. Yeah. Um, so making recommendations and doing these questionnaires, doing the team assessments, that's one intervention that sports psychologists can do. Okay. Okay. Now you're, you're going over the nine components, right? Mm -hmm. I stopped you. No, you're good. I can't remember every single. That's totally right fine. What, what do you remember? Uh, so I think I've said all the ones that I, okay. Right all now. good. All good, dude. All good. <laughs> Here's the thing. Like, it's not like I was like, Hey Jeff, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, Have your I notes. Know. Like, I know I'm like putting you on the spot with some of these things. Good. Um, so routines, obviously super important. Um, where does visualization fall into a routine? Yeah. So it, it's really up to the athlete. I think, and I was just talking about this the other day. Every professional athlete, whether they're aware of it or not, does some kind of imagery practice. Yeah. You know, when you're laying down to sleep at night, you're probably going over what you did in training that day. Yep. Or the day before. Or, you know, maybe going over a competition or a technique and be like, dang it, Josh McKinney always gets me in this knee slice. I hate that <laughs> knee slice. What am I going to do to get him? I can't have him knee slice me again. Yeah. So you're running it over in your head. And that's a lot of the um, the way that we can start problem solving. And I think that's an important part of overall sport and of human development is that critical thinking. Yeah. We get that from anything that we really are experts in. doesn't matter if we're an expert bagel slicer, yeah. you know, but constantly trying to problem solve. Um, and through imagery, we can start developing that ability to problem solve. And then we're also, while we're doing imagery, we're, we're activating the same part of our brain, the mirror neurons in our brain. When we're seeing someone do something, we're activating the mirror neurons, but we're actually activating the motor neurons in the motor cortex right. when we visualize. But the only thing is it's not going from your brain to your body to make the motion happen, but it's making those neurons wire together, making them more refined. And it's, it's sharpening that part of the decision process even though we're not getting the conditioning component of doing the move yeah. and getting the, maybe the, the dexterity, but we're also sharpening the mind that we have that's going to execute that move. And that's what they're finding is visual practice, uh, visualizing can be as good as actual practice. And as part of a routine, I think the more you do it, if you make it a structured practice, that's going to only give you more of a competitive edge. But it takes some energy, right? It yeah. takes some effort. And, you know, for me, I found time in my day to do it. And it's, it's part of my routine. I know when I'm, well, I'm not going to suggest people do this. Don't do this if it's going to mean you're going to crash. But I, I like it a lot of times while I'm driving because you can kind of just let your mind wander. Mm -hmm. I'll start thinking about some techniques while I'm driving. Yeah. And then I'm using that time to start sharpening my technique. And please don't, don't drive dangerously guys. Yeah. But that's one way that I've built it into a routine where I'm going to mentally practice whatever techniques that I'm reviewing that day. Well, I think a lot of people, they do that and not even, they're just not conscious that they do it. I mean, mm -hmm. how many times do you go and, and you drive and then you get to the wherever you're going, you're like, how the hell did I get there? Right? Like that's like a form of hypnosis, right? right. From my understanding. Yeah. So you get there, you, you just drifted off. Think it could have been thinking about the bills, thinking about work, could have been thinking about anything, but mm -hmm. like, you're just making the conscious choice to like use that in another way. Mm -hmm. People are already kind of doing that. Right. Oftentimes. Yeah. yeah. I think your brain switches, um, from its normal operating functions. It switches on the default mode network, Yeah. switches between different levels of consciousness, which is akin to what you're saying with hypnosis. Yeah. Um, basically we do that naturally. Right. And I think if you could do something beneficial to your technique, right. It's like maximizing, you know, you're doing well, the best that you can. Yeah, so I 100%. just use that time to, to visualize. And I think there's certain ways people could go about it. And I talk, I talk to this with Josh, you know, there's a, a geeky acronym 
you know, you have pet lip, you have, um, first of all, you have your, how your body is in that environment, what you're going to be wearing. You have the environment, you're thinking about the environment completely. You're thinking about the task. You're thinking about the time. You're thinking about your perspective. You're going to have some kind of development. So you're going to see yourself learning. And then also you're going to be thinking, man, about the emotions that are involved okay. in that, in that overall experience. And by going through these different components, seeing yourself in first person, what it's like, and also third person, you can get the most out of the visualization. Yeah. A lot of times we don't go through all those things. We don't make it as visceral. We don't think about the whole sensory experience. So maybe it's not as beneficial. Yeah. And by, by adding some uh, different components in, like I'm talking about this acronym, you can get the most out of it that science says has been right. the most beneficial. Right. And like, and, 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 you know, using imagery and visualization like that can, can apply to all areas of life, right? Not mm -hmm. just sport. It mm -hmm. can be, it can be business. It can be family relationships. Absolutely. It yeah. can, you can apply this. So this isn't just, you know, for jujitsu practitioners or, you know, you know, for, you know, athletes, this yeah. is for everybody, right? right. You I can, mean, we use it to treat people that have PTSD. Yeah. You know, if someone had a traumatic thing, you know, if you have guys going out to war and they had a terrible thing happen to, you know, something happened that, that stuck with them and they developed a trauma related disorder. Right. You can use visualization. And I, I mean, you've heard of people using video games to to treat PTSD as well, because it's a stimulus really? in their brain that they're afraid of. There, It leads to all these avoidance. It leads to the physiological arousal. It leads to the re-experiencing of things through visualization is one of the ways that we can treat PTSD. So it's used for many, many different things. I was just adding to your point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, well, I didn't know that they were using video games to help with like PTSD mm -hmm. and different, I mean, it, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Because I mean, what, what's happening there from my understanding is like, you're, you're stuck in this negative feedback mm -hmm. loop, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are visualizing, like you're just constantly visualizing the negative over and over and yeah. over. And it's hard to get out of that, that space. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine, you know, being able to visualize and, and try to get probably more specifically to that third person perspective mm -hmm. to where you can kind of remove yourself from that situation and just be like, you know, looking at it and like thinking like, Hey man, I'm in this negative, this loop. And I, I know, and we don't have to go down this tangent, but I know like this is where like psychedelics and different things like psilocybin are really coming into play in today's mm -hmm. medicine, right? Yeah. Like helping people get out of PTSD and these negative feedback loops and different yeah. things. It changes the way the brain is organized. Right. And it allows them to develop insight. Right. have a different view of the situation and by just stepping out of that headspace that they're stuck in that negative loop that you're talking about right it, it can be very much uh, very therapeutic yeah you know and i wish that they would allow more research and develop more protocols for it but yeah. there's been a kibosh and a stigma associated with these type of medicines right yeah we're getting there we're getting there dude um so if somebody wanted to you know incorporate some sort of practice like mm -hmm. what would you recommend for you yeah. know for anybody whether they're you know an athlete or not so it, it's really difficult because people really vary on um visualization skills right some people are just like i'm a terrible artist so it's really hard for me right it's yeah. taken me a long time um uh to develop that awareness in my own mind of what i could see in my mind's eye so with people sometimes it, it requires watching some video like i talked about you could use a a GoPro and put it on yourself and yeah. watch the GoPro and maybe just have the GoPro going, do a technique that you would normally do just so you could get that look yeah. of what it would look like and then watch the video. So you got in your mind's eye. That's like kind of stepping it up, kind of training wheels. Um, I would say it really depends on the person how complex a technique would be. You know, as far as the first step, it depends on the person and how complex they're able to think about jujitsu. Yeah. If you have a black belt or purple belt, you guys are like experts. You've been doing it for many years, right? Um, where if someone's like a white belt, they may not be able to recognize the, where the body moves or how it moves or have all the imagery in their, their brain. So that's where you need to start stepping it up and maybe taking baby steps like pictures or video okay. to start getting in your head. Um, but with practice, they start developing. I would say it could be as simple as a very basic move. And then move on to series of moves, move on to whole fights. You know, you can make a mental fight and see how oh, if the guy goes and tries to grab my leg, does a shot, this is what I can do. I can sprawl, yeah. whatever it is. You know, you can you can make it more complicated as you go. And it might even be as simple as reviewing something that happened that day. Yeah. So, oh, today, you know, this is what happened. Josh McKinney did the knee slice. You know, this is the type of knee slice that he does. This is the grips that he has. And just trying to first start 
thinking about how you would react right with all these components that i talked about the environment talking about the timing talking about the emotions all those things yeah yeah and then so how how long would you recommend somebody start out five minutes three minutes um i would say whatever their tolerance is yeah um ideally uh the you know most research supports that you do it for you know around three times a week between five to 20 minutes a lot of people get bored in that amount of time yeah um some people get very excited it's, it's very common for me. If I'm thinking about a competition, my heart rate will start going up. Yeah. You know, but yeah. if, if you do it um, and you're finding your heart rate goes up, you can then engage in whatever kind of regulatory strategies you use during a competition. Yeah. For me, I use a lot of mindfulness. I use centering exercises. I focus on what I'm feeling, a lot of bodily acceptance. And then that allows me to start to tolerate that experience. Right. And that translates to my ability to be clutch in competition situations yeah so you can actually visualize not only the technique but you can visualize your own mental skills strategies yeah and and practice those mental skills so that when you need them when you're under pressure you've already trained them as well yeah so five to 20 minutes is ideal if you go for an hour great yeah you know but um i would say if it if it gets boring or irritating or you get tired because of it you know like if it let's say it's before a competition what do people naturally do before competition like how how close to the competition? Like the night before. Oh, like the night before. They're probably like obsessing over the the, the match, having a hard time even sleeping. Yep. Yeah, man. I can mm-hmm. remember like, even whenever I was just competing and fighting, I actually kind of lived in that constant state where I'm, like, I'm constantly visualizing this guy. My heart's always racing, mm-hmm. and I'm just trying to like br- bring it down. But yeah. dude, your mind the night before, your mind's just racing like all yeah. these infinite possibilities. Uh-huh. Right, and then the, I'd say that's where you're using visualization too much. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're living there too you're, much. You're sitting there and you're thinking about it. Oh, I'm gonna do this technique. And maybe this, what if this happened? You know. Yeah. And you're running over your technique because like that crunch before the night before. You know. You're yeah. Like, I'm gonna study a whole bunch the week before. Train a bunch the week before. You're trying to cram for the test. So it's like too late. In, in that situation, too much. You need to do something to relax. Yeah. Maybe a meditation. Distract yourself. Whatever it is. Listen to some music. Right. Breathing exercises. That's too much visualization the night before. That's gonna wear you out. Yeah. So you know five to 20 minutes is what i like to do on a as a regular routine the day before you know what i was doing i was i just recently competed in the fuji pro and i I fought a very game opponent um stefan wyatt you know uh for me i i had to drive an hour just like the far side of st charles to get over there right (laughs) yeah dude it's all the way out there i'm from south city and i recognized that i was as i was driving i had a particular music i would listen to so that act as a contextual cue for me to start visualizing yeah. I, not only did I have the environment, I was always driving, right? But I also had the music that I would say I would listen to a very type of a very particular type of dubstep called bro step. Okay, you know? <laughs> it's stupid, but I can dig it. It man. gets me going. It gets Whatever me going. gets you there. Um, and I would listen to the music, and I recognize I was anxious, anxious, anxious. 20, 30, 40 minutes of visualizing, and then fifty minutes later, I finally realized like I just whew, I felt like uh, the anxiety broke. I had finally habituated to it. I had finally found the point where I had visualized enough and I mentally exposed myself that my body's like, oh, I don't need to be anxious anymore. Right. I can relax. I don't need to be in fight or flight response. Yeah. So I had I'd done it enough that by the time I got to the competition, I was totally chill. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I, I, things went well. Um, Stefan almost submitted me. He had me a great new bar. I got out, you know, and, uh, and then I... I got some points and I won the match. Yeah. But it was through using visualization that I think that I mentally prepared myself for the anxiety of that competition. Right. But we got to be careful not to do it too much because if it makes us exhausted, yes, you know, and some of my training partners say, Oh, I hate it. You know, I'm just sitting there thinking about the fight and they can't relax all day. Yeah. You're going to go to the, the competition the next day and be exhausted. Yeah. He's trying to find that balance. I always would try to take that. It's like, all right, man, well you can't have your heart racing when you're competing. Like now you got to like slow it down. And mm-hmm. that's when I would, I would try to like tap into my breath. Mm. I feel like breath work is just so powerful and so important. The, the important component is that yes, through breathing, you can slow down your heart rate. You can increase what's um, heart rate variability, Mm. which is another uh, important predictor of flow. Yeah. Do you keep track of your HRV? I do not. Okay. Because I don't have a good tracker. Yeah. Um, you know, the iPhone's okay. Yeah. But, uh, but it's not great. Like there's, um, one heart math that I use a lot for working with athletes Okay. going through it. You know, you can go through a tough competition, do biofeedback and see how they physiologically respond to mm-hmm. it and then get them to learn how to, um, 
like intuitively control their heart rate. Yeah. That's something you can get to do with them. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I don't track it. I use more of the breathing component because I like it as an anchor for the present moment, Yes, which is an important part of mindfulness. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So you have a regular breath work practice. I do. What's that look like? So on a daily basis, I usually check in with myself as I'm going through work, school, yeah. clinical work, all these other things I'm doing in training. It looks pretty different. I do a lot of, um, active breathing and acceptance of whatever physiological experiences I'm feeling. So like as I'm dying cardio wise, yeah. learning how to not judge that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's part of mindfulness. So right. I'll do that breath work while I'm training, but it also could be as simple as five minutes before I go to bed. I do my breathing exercise to help me go to sleep. And then that just makes me aware of how I can be presently focused and yeah. not judgmental. And that's just at the end of my day or throughout the day, I'll take a couple deep breaths. It could look like a lot of different things. If you've developed that skill, Yeah, I'd say if you're starting out, I don't know what you like to do, but if, if you're starting out and I'm sure you can say to this, like sometimes structured meditation practice is the best way to start learning how to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, cause you're, you're building the skill, mm -hmm. right? You're learning the principles so that way now you can apply it to other areas. Right. And we yeah. do this all the time in jujitsu, right? It's like learn this concept and then conceptually, we can apply this same, whether it's like a cross collar choke. It's like, you can do this from mount, mm -hmm. or it's basically the same thing as like, if you go to the back and you do a double lapel, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. conceptually, you can take this and you can apply this to all areas of your life, right? right. So it's just getting that foundation in mm -hmm. to where you are able to, again, tap into the breath, like you said, be mindful, kind of separate yourself from your thoughts and just like come to the present using your breath to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you start problem solving with each situation. Right. Oh yeah. And I think with mindfulness, the, the, the thing that people don't connect all the time is they, they don't connect it to their sport. And this is something that I work on with athletes a lot is you ideally should be able to be mindful the entire time you're competing, but that's not just going to happen. Yeah. That's going to take a stepwise practice. What do you need to be mindful of when you're competing? You know, I say that because I think it's, you can get all consumed with mm -hmm. everything going mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Like what would you recommend somebody like, what do you need to focus on? Yeah. So let, let's take a step back yeah. just so that we can all agree on the same definition. Okay. When I say mindfulness, I adhere to John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, which is two components, presently focused, being non-judgmental. Okay. That's the two components of mindfulness. And it's not a state. It's, it's not like something where your mind is blank. It's not like a meditative state. It's a part of meditation. Yeah. But all mindfulness is, is a way of paying attention. Okay. And it's basically this meta attention of being aware of whatever comes up for you in that moment, being aware of the, all the experiences that are there in that moment and be presently focused. You're not focused on what just happened a minute ago. You're not thinking about what's about to happen. You're thinking about exactly in the moment. And now in competition, we use mindfulness as a way, like when you think of the best athletes, right? What are, what are some of your favorite athletes? Some of the best athletes of all time. I mean, like Michael Jordan, Kobe course, Bryant, yeah. you know what I mean? Peyton Manning, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you go across all sports, Albert Pujols was a great, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like whoever you like, obviously I'm naming like St. Louis people and different things, but they're just Michael Phelps. You mentioned one, mm -hmm. like dude, one of the, the greatest athletes now is like Jaden Cox, who's this fucking phenomenal wrestler this young kid like yeah so i mean there's so many yeah and i think when you see them compete where do you see their focus are they laser focused are they kind of just like not really focused are they thinking about something that happened a week ago usually they're laser focused all about the present yeah and i i see that in so many athletes that when they're really on like craig jones when i see him go out there and just murk people with heel hooks dude craig yeah craig jones gordon ryan like we're talking jujitsu like these guys are insane when you see craig jones he's relaxed you know he's talking to the crowd he's hanging out he's completely in the present moment mm -hmm. where you see some competitors they're staring at the ground they're listening to their music they're they're someplace else yeah you know yeah so for me that's what i used to do i was trying to pump myself up and be super like agitated before I fight. And then I realized there's too many emotions. Yeah. And it was very distracting trying to control the emotions. So I went on to this other thing where I would start accepting and just allowing myself to feel whatever was there. Yeah. So mindfulness allows you to be completely focused in the present moment. What comes up for you and not get distracted by whatever experiences are there. Right. Because a lot of times we'll have something come up or we'll be like, Oh, this is a tough fight. And you think, Oh no, I'm not going to win this. You're not present. You're not focused. You're thinking about your points, you're thinking about what's going to happen. You think, oh man, I've been cutting weight. I just want this to be over. Right. You're not present. Right. And then people will defeat themselves because they're not 
present. They're that's, not focused. That's so true. That's so true. And um, I feel like I heard, I don't know what it was, but it was like, if you're anxious, it's like you're living in the in the future, right? And if you're depressed, you're kind of like living in the past. Yeah. And then it's like kind of being present is going to dissipate that. Yeah. And I work on, on that with a lot of people that emotions have a purpose. You know, um, uh, aside from whatever spiritual beliefs that you have, we can say emotions have a purpose. Yeah. Depression is there because we perceive a loss. Anxiety is there because we perceive a threat. Fear is actual threat in our environment. Uh, guilt is that we've somehow impaired a relationship that's important to us. You know, each emotion has a specific context. Anger is that there's a goal that we have that's being impeded. Mm. That's why we have anger. So each emotion has a purpose. And if we accept that no matter what, we're going to feel emotions. Right. You know, you, it takes that weight of, oh, I need to control this. I can't feel this thing. Yeah. And then it's one less thing that you need to worry about while you're trying to compete. Yeah, that makes sense. And then that's that being non judgmental, right? Like mm-hmm. detaching yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, Which is hard. It's, it's super hard. I mean, you know, if, if we're talking in the context of uh, just like meditation, right? Like mm-hmm. I've, oftentimes you hear like you are not your thoughts and that's kind of like where the reps come in, right? Like we'll have all these crazy fucking thoughts and it's mm-hmm. easy to like get attached to this thing yeah. and then to start identifying with that thing. But if you are trying to like, you know, focus and, you know, uh, maybe just breathe, you, you'll see these thoughts come and go and like your mm-hmm. your job is to kind of get back to center and just be present and like not get attached to any one thought. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. is, am I explaining that well? Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's kind of like my understanding the concept of meditation. Is, is, is like that is one <clears throat> byproduct that comes because of meditation and they call that cognitive distancing. Okay. Which is like, so like, let's just say in psychology, one of the predominant models is that um, thoughts are connected to emotions, which are connected to behaviors and they're all interconnected. Yeah. So if we change any one of these things, we'll change everything else. And one of the ways, because we're competing, right? You're going to have the thought, Oh, my knee hurts. Oh, my shoulder hurts. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, I just hurt myself. Whatever it might be. It could just be a cramp, but that thought will distract you and take away from your overall ability because attention is basically only so much capacity that we have. It's like a flashlight. And if we're using some of our attention to focus on my knee that hurts or my shoulder that hurts, it's taking away from my overall processing ability to think, oh, I got to counter this move and get this guy in this technique. You know, it takes away from your overall ability to process. And we only have so much that our brain is capable of doing at any one time. Right. So if we're focused on that thought, oh, my shoulder hurts, it takes away from your ability to to focus and compete and think critically in that moment and perform to your best capabilities. So that that meditation component that we're talking about, that cognitive distancing allows thoughts to come up and not necessarily influence emotions or influence behaviors, Mm -hmm. but it also allows you not to get distracted. Right. So that's why mindfulness, even though it's kind of like been very much popularized by broader culture, it's kind of like woo woo. Mm -hmm. It is one of the best techniques any athlete can practice. 100%. And it's like rooted in science. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if uh, there was a, I don't know how long ago it was. I don't know if it was like in Vietnam or when it was, but there was a a, a, a soldier. He was a prisoner of war. And uh, I feel like it was Vietnam. Either way, during the entire time, it was like 18 months or something, you know, he was uh, he was captive. To help the time go by, like every day he would play uh, 18 rounds of golf on his favorite course. And then after – have you heard this before? Mm-mm. Oh, and then um, after all this time – um, whenever he finally did get home and get out, you know, got out of war and whatnot, he went and played the 18 rounds. And I think he played, um, like better than he'd ever played before. And it was just like every, every day, like playing that same 18 holes, walking the course, you know what I mean? Like going through the motions and yeah. it made him better at golf or it, just it. as good, you know, yeah. before he left. Right. You know I what I mean? It. Yeah. And I, they've done studies where they've had people practice, shooting um, free throws with their non-dominant hand. Yeah. So their left hand, and then they had people visualize it. Yeah. One would practice, one would just visualize, and both groups were the same when they Mm. test them afterwards. So that visualization is there. I think, you know, if you use visualization to cope, like if you're having a bad day, you do some happy visualization, it can be motivating for you. Yeah. You know, imagine yourself visualizing and succeeding. You know, imagine if you're going through it, you know, you're losing all your competitions, you're trying your best to be competitive and you're just losing. 
Um, you can use visualization to make yourself feel better. Yeah. You can think about the happy days. You can think about your victories. You can think about all these things. And, I, I you know, that's a beautiful story of the guy in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, and it sounded like that's how he's coping with the tough situation. Right, dude, because essentially, I mean, you're in a, a terrible situation, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, you're in war, you're a prisoner, and then, uh, yeah, man, just to make the time go by. And we hit record. <laughs> yeah, dude, just to make the time go by, I just thought that was just so fascinating that um, just that one act, like he can't play golf every day, Yeah. And, but it still kept him sharp. Um, I feel like anybody could can do that. Um, but one of the components, and like you were kind of breaking that down with, with the acronym, like you want to get as detailed as possible with this, right? Like you want to... Yeah. Like, what's the environment look like? Mm-hmm. What are the smells? Like, yeah. what are like what are you hearing? What are you wearing? Like, mm-hmm. what what are you like everything that's going on? Like, you want to get as detailed as possible, right? Yeah, I, I think that's it. It activates more of your brain. It calls upon more of those memories, which are parts of those memories, right? It's your gi, how it feels on your skin, is a memory. Like, I used to train with a rash guard on. Yeah, you know, and um, when I go to compete, usually you don't have a rash guard on. Yeah, so by visualizing yourself without that rash guard it means that it's one less thing that's novel about that experience yeah and the more detail you can put into it it just calls upon all those ex- sensory experiences as cues yeah to get you back into those that state which allows you to remember your techniques mm. that they're makes all sense. interconnected yeah it all man everything just plays together yeah. everything is so connected but it's, it's easy to forget that or easy just yeah. to, to think everything is kind of on its own right dude how long have you been training so you're you're a black belt for yeah. the listeners right i mean yeah i um i got my black belt under upiano malachish he owns a gracie baja school in west chase texas okay um i started with master carlos gracie jr back um 2007 I started doing MMA first, and then I wasn't very good at it. I had <laughs> my buddy popped my arm, um, and I was like, dang, i got to learn how to do that. So then I, I, my buddy got me a job working at Gracie Baja, and I just it was me working, training for many, many years. After I broke my foot, like we talked about earlier, I went back to school, got my bachelor's degree in psychology, and I, I realized as I was competing more and more, like I would be on and off, on and off, on and off. And yeah. I was like, what's, what's the difference? Same person. I'm doing all the same training. You know, I'm doing the weightlifting. I'm doing the dieting. I'm doing the, the techniques, everything. What's the difference between these competitions? And I was thinking mentally that was my biggest weakness. I would be too emotional, not emotional enough, not motivated, you know, and not being able to cope with the stress of cutting weight. Yeah. So then I started focusing on sports psych ever since I got my bachelor's. I got a master's degree in clinical psych because I was always more interested in the clinical end of psychology and, and, and jujitsu. Many, many athletes. We are such a high risk population because we're cutting weight. We're getting injured constantly. You have guys in MMA and jujitsu. They're getting concussions. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just see that they, they need a certain level of care that's more than just maybe someone talking about visualization. They need somebody that also knows how to treat depression, anxiety, concussions. So that's why I went to clinical psych. Yeah. And I've been training for 13 years now and, and trying to very much one day wed my love for sports psychology to be able to help out people in the jiu-jitsu community yeah. and be able to help some athletes. I know there's not going to be much money within the jiu-jitsu community. <laughs> like, that's what I love, right? And that's an important part of understanding the sport. Um, that's just the I geek out with grappling sports, man. You know, I just love MMA. Yeah. Um, I, I do help people that do volleyball and baseball and all these other games, but it's just not my passion. And right. knowing the game very deeply helps you be able to help whatever the athlete is struggling with. Yeah, me being able to understand the details of competition and what it's like, what it's like to have five, six fights in a day yeah. at a competition as a sports psychologist would really help me consult with them. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there really is no better teacher than experience. Yeah. And and to be able to help somebody, it helps to understand like what they are going through. So if you've gone through it yourself, you know, that just makes all the difference in the world. Like yeah. somebody can study a sport and have, you know, they can understand, you know, they can, they can know it front to back, but if they've never done it, there's just, there's just too many intricacies and just so many small things that you just can't possibly understand. Yeah. And I mean, like, if you're like, oh man, did you just get a touchdown? And they're like, we don't have touchdowns. (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah. So it would, it would be really stifling to the, to the athlete if you didn't at least understand the sport in some capacity. Right. So, um, me doing jujitsu has been, um, a love, a passion. It's something that I still love to do. I still like to compete. Um, and I think competition brings you things that maybe you don't always, you're not always aware of. Yeah. And I think I don't love competing, Yeah. but I love what it does for you. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, I can dig that. I um I kind I competed for so long with MMA. I did that for almost a decade. Yeah. I kind of got to this point to where I didn't feel like I had anything to prove anymore. And like I, there's it just there's there's a certain level of ego that's needed for yeah. competition. You just yeah. absolutely have to have it. Yeah. And um, just between having competed so much and just maybe some of my psychedelic adventures or something, I'm just like, man, I just don't. I'm not feeling it, man. So like there, I did I did a uh, worlds two years ago, mm-hmm. and then um, I think it was last year I did. Uh, I did the last respect is what I did. And I only kind of did the last respect just because, like, my, my coach, Mike, really wanted me to do it. But mm-hmm. you really got to want it. Like, you, you like your mind has to be in into competing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they're, it just if your mind's not into it, like, you're just never going to compete well. And this is a really interesting thing. I work a lot with values when I'm working with athletes because okay. if we just have the an outcome goal where it's like, I want to win this tournament. Yeah. What happens when you win that tournament? It's nothing. I mean, you win, but then it's like, okay, well, what what do I do now? What do you do now? Yeah, that's when people start feeling lost, dude. Yeah. Or if, if you're like me, I kind of grew up to where um, if you do everything you're supposed to do, you expect to win. Mm-hmm. So, like, you get there, and then I was always taught, like, act like you've been there before. So then you don't get the same high from winning. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, man, I'm supposed to do this. But right. then if you lose, then you're pissed off, and right. you think about it for weeks. Well, <laughs> what if you get second or third place? You're super bummed down. You're super bummed, dude. You know, I got third place in the world, and I was like, you know, uh, I for me, I'd, I'd worked for so many years to get that place, and I was so disappointed. Yeah. Even though I was standing on the podium, and I look back, and I was like, man, you know, you beat hundreds of people out on that bracket to yeah. be able to get there. You should be able to enjoy it. Yeah. And I think um, an outcome perspective is really hard to embrace where it's like I'm only interested in winning. Right. Where there should be a process orientation where it's like going through this actions. I should be maybe focused on the beauty of the technique, executing my game to its best potential. Winning will be a consequence of that execution. Yes, 100%. And and, and for me, think focusing on values. So like we're not always going to feel like training. Right. And there's lots of times where I don't feel like training. Yep. But I have the value of, let's say, excellence or being a good teammate, being there for my training partners. I know even though I don't have a competition coming up, there's people that rely on me to give them those looks to be right. able to test them. So even though I feel tired, run down, stressed out, not sleeping very well, whatever it might be, I have the value that's going to be my meter through which I'm going to judge my behavior. Right. And and if you use values, you you think of it as a compass. You're much more likely to get to a place where you're happy. Yeah. Where if I then if I have this outcome perspective that I just want this one material thing. Yeah. 100%. Like that's really the way to go. Like if you can kind of reframe the way you think and, mm-hmm. and, and worry about the process, like that's the, the results will happen. You know what I mean? Like that. And I, I kind of, uh, usually kind of like put that more in towards like in the business context yeah. because you know, like I'm, I'm self-employed, like I'm an entrepreneur. So like, it's easy to get like, you want to make the money, you want to make the money, you want to make the money. You know what I mean? Or whether it's competition for sport, like you want to win, you want, but like, if you just focus on the process Mm -hmm. and just like, just doing the things that you need to do Mm -hmm. that you're going to win, you know, the outcome is just going to happen. And sometimes you don't win, but that's okay. You stick with it until that opportunity meets luck and then that's success, right? Yeah. That preparation and opportunity come together. Right. Um, I think the only biggest problem with that is that you don't always have the emotions. Yeah. Where we talked about emotion earlier that, and I, I don't think I said this, but emotions, their ultimate function is to motivate behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why we have anxiety is to get us to do something to prevent an outcome. Yeah. That's why we have anger so that we're energized to, you know, if someone cuts you off, yeah. you're flashing your bright so that they don't cut you off again. Right. right. That's the intention of anger. You know, when you want to fight somebody, they did something that to harm you and your goal. So you want to fight them so they don't do it again. Right. So emotions have that motivating component. The problem with using values is you don't always feel motivated. Right. You don't always feel like I want to go train. I, I'm feeling pumped up where if you have that, like that energy, that excitement, it's way easier to train. Right. Where uh, if you're using your values, you don't always have that. Right. Pumped up feeling. And if you're just doing it for the process, you're enjoying the journey in each moment, each thing that comes up for you while you're doing it. Yeah. Where you're not, you know, not getting that high of, oh man, you know, this is a big return on this business that I started. Yeah. So that it's hard because you don't always have those emotions there to reward you. Yeah. Yeah. Most of our life we've been, 
we have that ape brain that says rely on your emotions for whatever action you should be doing. Yep. Yeah, dude, you 100% have to uh, like fall in love with the process and just like, I mean, that's where like discipline comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Like you got to be disciplined and like check into your value system Mm -hmm. because you're not always going to feel like doing it. Most times you're not going to feel like doing it. That's what separates, you know, the greats from, from the regular people. Right. Or Or even average. You're you're a big teacher. You teach a bunch of jujitsu, you know, not every student is going to succeed. Yeah. But when you have that one student that succeeds and you see the big change in them, you're like, this is why I teach right here. Oh, yeah. That that reward and, and just knowing that it's part of the process. And it, it's hard to have that focus. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of times focused on the outcome. And then that's where we have dissatisfaction. But you can do the reframing. You can focus on the moment. You can do all these things to try to check in with yourself and be aware of what's going on for you, you know? Yeah. Oh, this dude wants my shoulder right now. He wants the attention. That's well, okay. Do you, do you teach jujitsu now? Or um, I do not. Okay. I, I did many years of teaching. Um, I think for me, uh, I love jujitsu, but when it became a job yeah. where I was working on, on nonstop and I was blessed to have the job that I had, I was so grateful that I got the opportunity. I think it just made it so that I wasn't doing it as something pleasurable. It yeah. became a job. Yeah. So now that I'm doing more focus on sports psych and working on my degree, being a psychologist, having jujitsu be kind of an outlet, yeah. being able to maybe teach people that I train with. Like when I'm training, people ask me questions. I'll share whatever they I did and you know, share whatever techniques. Oh, this is how you, you can get out of my half guard or whatever it might be. Right. Um, for me, that's the only teaching that I'll ever do, right. I think. Um, it would be great in the future maybe to have something like that. But I think, like I said, there is this weird component when um, when you have external motivators so like money yeah. takes away from intrinsic motivation, yeah. which is my love for the sport. Right. And there's a lot of studies that they've done on that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, money is only so much of a motivator, right? Like they've yeah. done things. It's like up to X amount of dollars it'll motivate somebody. And then past that, it's just like, it's nothing. You yeah. Know I mean, you definitely got to want to do it. Yeah. For sure. I've been, um, I've been teaching 6 a.m. jujitsu like Monday through Friday. Super rough. I actually don't mind it, man. You like it's waking like, up early? Okay. I do. I wake up early anyway. And um, I kind of started sleeping a little bit with everything going on. It's like, fuck, I don't got anywhere to be. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I'll, I'll sleep in a little yeah. bit. But um, I've been training with some guys. And man, like, it feels good to like wake up and like go teach these guys and, and see them get better. And mm-hmm. then, you know, like, you'll teach them a concept and they probably have already seen it a couple of different times, but then like, then it just clicked and it's like, Oh man, my jujitsu game just like completely got better. It feels very good. Like, I don't get paid to do it. I just do it because I like to do it. And like, yeah. it helps me train. I found teaching has made me better at jujitsu. Yeah. Um, and there's some interesting stuff here that I think might, we can might geek out on. Um, you are making some movements which are intuitive, explicit. So you're, ma- you're putting a language to a movement yeah. that you have to explain, yeah. but it also makes you more likely to choke under pressure. Really? Yes. Oh, There's some wow. interesting research where, um, and some of the best athletes that I've seen, they don't always know what they're doing. They're just like, yeah, I just went out and this just happened did it. Yep. because they have it implicit. And, mm-hmm. and by making it explicit and using language, it's actually more likely that your brain, when it processes the move, it has certain chunks in the move, right? Yeah. We, we chunk things together. So like a phone number, here's an example of a chunk. We say da-da-da, da-da-da, yep. da-da-da, da-da-da, right? We have those four chunks that we right, use. Right, right. And that's for mem- memory, memory efficiency. Right. And the same thing happens with the technique. We have certain chunks. And if I start focusing on one component of that technique, let's say I'm under pressure, there's a lot of theories about what goes on under pressure. Yeah. One is that we double our efforts to focus on the move because we don't want to fail. Yeah. But by doubling it, it takes it apart instead of making those efficient chunks, mm-hmm. and then it fails. Oh, really? So when we teach, it actually could set us up for choking under pressure. Oh, wow. I've never thought of it like that. That's interesting. My experience has been that, to your point, like I... I naturally did these things with my body and mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily understand like what exactly I was doing mm-hmm. or why that, I, like why I do it. But like having taught kids class for I guess three years now and then, um, you know, teaching adults some, I found that like when I have to like really think about what I'm doing, it's helped me. It's, it's actually made me better because it's like, Oh man, I do this. And like, why do I do this? Oh, because I do this. And, um, it's just like, if you're just focusing on like the fundamentals, like elbows in or this here, his, mm-hmm. like it just it just helps me anyway. Focus on just like just the little the little details that will put everything together. Yeah. And then maybe it's just like I'm at that 
that point because I've been doing this for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a, a big piece to uh, to like time and belt. Um, I feel like some people, you can have some amazing grapplers, and they can just start doing jujitsu, and they can crush upper belts just because they're physically good enough, but they don't really have the understanding mm-hmm. of jujitsu. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I always think of... Uh, I always say like jujitsu is like you're looking at this problem and the longer you look at it, like the different possibilities kind of start coming out at you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like in the beginning, man, you know, when people are uh, just starting jujitsu, I always say it's like uh, just like drinking from a fire hose, man. Like you're just getting all this information and you feel like you're never getting better and you can't really comprehend it all. But really, man, you're just trying to survive and you're just trying to get like this foundation. And a lot of that is just like understanding the positions and like mm-hmm. learning how to move your own body. And then we can start like fine tuning this thing. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it's just that I've been looking at the problem long enough and like for me breaking it down um, after having done it for so long has just like helped me because mm-hmm. I can remember feeling like I could never teach. Like I would yeah. never get to that point. It just right. didn't make sense. Yeah. But since I've been doing it, it's just like, man, yeah, I do do this. And it's actually kind of helped tighten up my game. Yeah. I, I think it also, you're developing mem- mental maps of yeah. techniques. And um, so like experts, I talked about this with Josh a little bit. The experts think about things differently yeah. than novices. Mm-hmm. So um, a good example is like Danaher. Danaher talks about wedges, right? And, yeah. And, and for you to understand what that means, you're yeah. like, you have, it, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy that fits into so many techniques. Yeah. You know, and, and, and by developing these ways of thinking that are like heuristics almost, they're, yeah. the, like Dan Harris says it's a system, it's more of a heuristic, but I'm not getting into semantics here. What's a heuristic? Um, it's a rule of thumb. Okay, cool. Um, where a system is like something like an algorithm where you're going to get to a solution if you do this. However, if I bridge and turn and shrimp, even though I'm using my wedges, it does not necessarily mean I'm going to get a solution. Right. But it's a judgment tool that I know if a guy has this position, I'm going to go, I mean, for this general body position, I'm going to go for this general move and it's right. generally going to lead to this position. Yeah. It's more heuristic. Yeah. That makes uh, sense. So, um, with the thinking about it, I think through teaching, you're developing these mental maps and how to explain things and how to go about a move in more complicated ways. that makes you more efficient in thinking about the positions. Yeah. It makes you be able to hold more information. Yeah. And that's much more akin to what an expert would think about when they're thinking about techniques. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, because like when you're teaching like white belts or blue belts or mm-hmm. something, you'll be teaching them a move and then you can see their wheels turning mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, well, what if we do this? And what if we do this? And it's like, I had to tell somebody the other day, it's like, man, if, if you look at jujitsu, whether it's like, if you think of it like a picture or a movie, or like we're just taking a snapshot of like a second or just this very little piece. And like, we're just working this, like there's so many possibilities and variations off of this one thing, which is why I think it's important to start getting into like the concepts and how can you apply those to the different areas. But it's like, man, jujitsu is just such a, uh, there's just so much of it. It's just such a breadth of, of just like work that man, there's just possibilities on possibilities, man. You just got to just like bring it in and just focus on the present. And right. like just this one little thing that we're doing. Yeah. Make it digestible. Yeah. 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 Cause that's just, sometimes it's just like slowing people down. It's like, Hey man, just focus on this and just do it over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Should I shut him up? He's telling sad stories right now. What? My cat's meowing a whole bunch. Oh, is he, is he, he's fine. Okay. I mean, it doesn't bother me. They okay. probably can't even hear it. Though, okay. To be honest good deal. With you. Yeah. Right. It's all good. Uh, do you do a lot of drilling? Um, so, uh, with drilling, there is some benefit. Um, I think it's to a certain point. Yeah. I think Kit Dale, you know, he has a whole kind of strong point on when you should drill, when you should not drill. And I look at experts and I, I think Roger Gracie said, one of the best things you can do is specific training, um, which is akin to drilling, Yeah. but it's not like something where I know there's some schools in the area that that really focus on doing a move 10,000 times or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I admire their discipline in doing that, but I also think that there's a certain amount of diminishing returns. Yeah. So you need to do a move a certain amount of times to get the interceptive experience, to be able to do that move, to have the dexterity to execute it. How long does that take? It depends on the people. Yeah. I would say after 100 times of doing the technique, maybe, you know, depending on how complex it is, after a thousand times, I think there's diminishing returns. Um, but there's, there's like an entropy, right? Yeah. There's a natural forgetting that humans do. So like 
I, I sometimes need to remember how to do even the most basic escapes Mm -hmm. where, you know, I'm like, Oh, you know, um, I don't usually get caught in submissions very often because I can keep with my guard and with my passing, I can usually keep people at bay unless I'm dealing with somebody very sharp, you know, like uh, some of my training partners, they'll catch me in positions that I haven't been caught in in weeks or months. Right. And and then I'm like, Oh wait, I forgot how to defend this. Mm -hmm. So there's a natural forgetting curve. And I think drilling certain things will keep you sharp um, but there's also doing it too much, like just by doing a thousand of any kind of pass does not mean that you're going to do it better than the person that did it 500 times. Yeah. Especially if those are sloppy reps. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and there's also this whole overuse and, and you can just get tendonitis from just doing something too much. Yeah. So there's diminishing returns. I think drilling is important, um, to a point, yeah. but then being able to have develop very fine tuned decision processes. So you, you know, when to do certain other moves or when to switch it up or, or make certain decisions is more important than necessarily doing it 10,000 times. Right. And that's that decision processes are going to be developed through specific training. Right. Where you have the guy defending and trying to deal with that situation where I see Roger Gracie did a lot of specific training and he was, in my opinion, one of the best of all time. Yeah. And I think he, he, he did um, do repetitions enough. But then after that, he focused more on specific competencies within certain positions, certain yes. chunks yeah. of the game. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's probably one of the best ways to kind of tackle it. Like my, one, like the, the way I like to lead class or kind of – I like the structures. Like, you know, we'll do a warm-up. There's some movement in there. Like some of the movement warm, – like warm-up movements we'll do will actually sometimes apply later on to the technique that we're about to do. But in the morning, then it's just like – 30 35 minutes of just like drilling a mm-hmm. technique like mm-hmm. nothing crazy but then we'll do some live rolls from position yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. usually applying to what we're doing i think those like those positional roles are so important yeah you know what i mean like you're gonna be here you're gonna like just set up whatever situation you want to set up and then go from there but like you you, de- you definitely have to have like that combination it can't just be all one or the other i feel like yeah and and i think drilling is is a and interesting to me because everyone everyone wants to keep getting better and they yeah. want to get better as fast as possible. Yeah. And and some people feel like that simple solution of I'm just going to drill it a hundred times. Yeah. Is not necessarily the best solution. The best solution is is to the trial and error process. Yeah. That helps and big time. There's this guy named um, I don't know his name, but he does School of Grappling on Instagram. Okay. Have you checked out his stuff? I have not checked that out. He has some pretty strong opinions about way the way you should train yeah um and he did those studies on adcc of like what were the the outcomes of each um adcc fight and you can go check out his stuff school of grappling i think is what it's called on instagram um and he he talks about how most of the fights the takedowns were single legs and i mean that is a study of just one tournament it's not obviously um completely translatable to all tournaments but it does show the meta in some ways school of grappling and yeah yeah Um, and it, 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 he has a bunch of studies that he did. Um, and he just basically, he says, um, developing here. Oh my goodness. Don't lose my point right now. Um, developing these situations, these games Mm -hmm. where you have someone, you put someone in situations. So like a good example in wrestling is you have one guy on his knees with his hands behind his back, the other guy standing up and they have to sprawl without using their arms. Right. And that's setting up the game so they'd learn how to turn the hips and balance in the sprawl yeah. without relying on their hands. Right. So they develop specific games, develop specific skills yes. without maybe necessarily making them uh, explicit. And that's a big thing that he talks about. Don't make it explicit. He talks a lot about heuristics. Don't make it explicit. He has a whole training model he's developed yeah. because of this. And it's in line with that idea of this is one thing where you can set up a game and it works really well with children yeah. to develop competencies that aren't necessarily me telling you how to do it. Right. Right. It's like Mr. Miyagi teaching Daniel's son how to song, paint. Song. Yeah. I didn't even think about it. That's a great way to think about it. That's a great analogy. Yeah. dude. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, bro. It, it's just, you just got to figure out how to sneak the knowledge in there. Right. Yeah, dude, that's powerful stuff, man. Um, well, dude, we could keep going forever, man. This has been such an amazing conversation. Yeah. I'd love to sit down with you again at some point, um, but I want to be respectful of your time. Of course. Um, so how can folks um, maybe like check you out or if there's anything you want to leave them with or maybe sure. some resources maybe you can point them to. And, and I can always sure. leave things in the show notes as well. Mm-hmm. But the um, um, floor is yours, brother. So I think if you're interested in sports psych, um, there is the uh, list of CMPCs, right? Um, and I will give you a list because uh, 
I want you to to find the person that's most empirically supported, uh, that knows what they're doing, yeah. um, that is licensed to do it. Um, just because not for my own well-being and me being in the environment, but because there's a whole lot of people that will sell you snake oil. Yeah, and you want integrity in your field. Yeah, I do. And um, I will share that list so that they can look it up and check it out. Also, some good books are things like um, George Munford has The Mindful Athlete. That's okay. a great book that will at least start getting people along the roads of how they can start instituting mindfulness in their sport. Yeah. Um, and then also... Um, you know, John Kabat-Zinn's basic um, full catastrophic living book is one of the best ones for developing that mindfulness okay. ability. And as far as like imagery, um, I don't know of any resources. There's one, oh my goodness, there's one app that people are using now that I can share that's a guided imagery app. Okay. These are just some resources that people can check out. Um, I'm, you know, kind of developing more along the lines of doing like a blog right now. So it's just Jeffrey Schulz. My last name is S-H-U-L-Z-E. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of other Schulzes out there. But I'm just going to be posting periodically on my blog and just getting stuff out there. And I think um, that's predominantly what I'm able to do right now because I'm going to be a licensed practitioner. I can't just go ahead and, and start treating people across state lines and right, doing right. all these things. I'd be very careful about what I put out there. Absolutely. But I think for educational purposes, I can talk about these things. Right. Um, just because of the regulations. Cool. Cool. Dude. Well, thanks again, man. Again, yeah. I'll put all this in the show notes so people can check it out. Um, dude, that's everything I have, man. I yeah. appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. Dude, Good talk. Je Jeffrey Scholes, ladies and gentlemen.